There he is. Hey. What's up, man? I thought you were Peter McKinnon for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but I had one inspection where there was a contractor present who was rather young and the insured uh, were talking about handguns and having handguns in the home and keeping one in the chamber. And I was thinking to myself, is this a place that I need to be right now? Am I safe? As I'm going around taking my measurements. It's it's not like it's, you know, you know, well, you gotta be a man, stand up for yourself, whatever. This is like, this is like a professional meeting, right? The homeowner basically is, is asking you to be there because they're saying, they're claiming, right? That they have some damage that's caused by a covered peril, right? And you're there to investigate that for the insurance company. I've had situations where I've, I felt like this could go in a very, very bad direction. The homeowner doesn't seem to be stable, right? There's something off. Um, the yeah. contractor is super aggressive and they are, you know, they're getting all bowed up and puffed up or whatever. Um, yeah. It's it's no longer, the, the appointment meeting, the inspection meeting is no longer being productive, right? It's not constructive. Yeah. If all they're doing is yelling and screaming, you know, I would, I have in the past just stopped right where I was and said, um, this inspection is over. And I just got my car and drove away. This is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Learn more at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. e &O provider Kaplik. Download the free insurance for adjusters guide at cplic.net slash adjustertv. And by Crawford Catastrophe Services. Join Adjuster TV at the 2022 Crawford & Company CAT Conference the first week of March 2022 in Orlando. There are literally dozens of training classes, including wildfire, flood, and several carrier certifications, among others. Register for the conference right now for early bird pricing. Get full details at crawco.com slash cat and scroll down to the conference link. The full link is in the description where you're watching or listening to this program. Again, Adjuster TV will be attending this conference, so when you sign up, let them know we sent you. Hey, what's up? Matt here with Adjuster TV. And for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe now. I'm here with Nathan Keller, and he is a new adjuster, right? Somewhat new adjuster. Been doing it about 13 years now. 13, okay. So you're, you're still pretty new, but you've got kind of a lay of the land, which I think we could probably, probably cover a little bit more ground with you because you've seen that there's stuff out there that you, you know that you don't know. And so you've kind of like, mm -hmm. you're starting to see the shape of everything, starting, starting to, to, to get a feel for like the, the ebb and flow, sort of the cycle of how the year looks as an adjuster and what yeah. it's like to be on a deployment. Have you, so you've done property claims? Like cap I've done property claims. I've heard about these, you know, these faded hail claims that are just the bread and butter of the adjusters. Oh, but so far, oh, I haven't run any hail. I've just done hurricane, total loss, fire, do a little proximity and some inside adjusting. So, okay, kind right of on. got a pretty good lay of the land. Right on, right on. So, yeah. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're from and and uh, you know what your story is. Yeah, I grew up in Ohio. Uh, I've kind of bounced around given different uh, industries over the years, but uh, I've done remodeling, carpentry. I built seven homes from the ground up. Um, I used to own a mural company. I've painted 70 murals around the country, like oh, wow. some in Denver, Alabama, Minneapolis, uh, some up in Portland for Nike, stuff like that. Um, Let's see, worked in video for a long time, Did used to do a lot of sports broadcasting. So in 2019, if you ever saw a slow-mo in college football where they were cutting to the commercial, that was me. Um, shot a lot of video stuff. Uh, and now- So you, you were one of those DSLR guys that was running around? Yeah, I was one yep. of those DSLR guys. I had a little the Ronin steady cam uh, okay. on the sidelines, uh, running to grab, you know, the celebration dance in the end zone, stuff like that. Um, Used to do a lot of that and then coronavirus hit and the sports broadcast world kind of shut down. So right. you know what I had to do? I had to adjust. So You're I'm right. here adjusting. Uh, I've been doing it for about uh, 13 months now. Got licensed January of 22, I believe. Uh, and I flipped a mid-roof 2017 or 2018 Ford Transit. So I've been living out of that. It's off-grid with solar on top and okay. foot pumps, little kitchen in there. Um, trying to keep the overhead costs as low as I possibly can, but currently 
in a really nice hotel. So <laughs> very nice. <laughs> Can't complain, but I definitely uh, you you come in really uh, excited, thinking you know a thing or two, until you uh, hop into the claims experience world and then realize you don't know anything. So that's why I very much appreciate the coaching call here, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, man, no problem. Well, let's 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 jump in. So I, I was asking everybody who does this, who wants to get on a call, to send kind of forward me some basic questions, um, and I'm going to kind of go through those, and then we can riff off of those from there. But totally recognize. I was, I was like, why do I recognize this dude's name? And you had he had reached out to me um, several months ago, right? A year ago. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it was and, right around the time I was getting into it. Yeah. So listen, still looking for a video editor, you know, just <laughs> that out there. So, um, yeah. <laughs> well, all right, well, let's, let's concentrate on the, the claim stuff and then we can, you know, talk about the other stuff later. So the first question that you have here is, is how do you know which storm deployments to accept? Um, let me throw that back to you and say, based on your experience so far, um, what would make you say no to a deployment and, you know, to basically, I guess, you know, what would make you say no to a deployment? I think at this point, the only thing that would really make me say no is if it's in the state of Louisiana. <laughs> okay. After experiencing Louisiana insureds and how they know as much about insurance as I do, or at least as I did when Probably. I went in there. So I got, I got, uh, if you really want to learn the hard way, how to jump into adjusting, I would say Louisiana, but that's the only thing I probably won't ever do Louisiana again. Cause it was, that was a, that was a storm. <laughs> I got you. So, so basically what you're saying is because they have so many hurricanes down there, they were telling you what you're going to do. And yeah, they were, they were prepared. They were ready for their adjuster to walk on the scene. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah. And I, I would say, you know, we, in no way would I ever disparage any particular state or area or city or whatever, but I will say that on the coastal areas, and this is just a general rule, um, they tend to be a little bit more sophisticated, I guess, when it comes to claims. Um, they may have had a, a bad experience previously. They may have been working with a PA, uh, public adjuster or some like super duper aggressive contractor that was really, you know, making a lot of hay in that area. Um, and because they have so many different claims experiences, um, they're, they're a lot less likely to, um, just let you do your job. Right. Um, I no. think it's a charitable way to say it. Um, as opposed to, you know, places in the Midwest where, or even like Dallas, where everybody's getting a new roof every five years. Um, there, those claims aren't life and death, right? Um, right. Hail claims. Um, if you're working like, you know, we were talking about in like the middle of nowhere in Nebraska, um, they get, you know, gigantic hail up there and windstorms and everything else. And they just deal with it. Um, and they, because hail, let's, let's, let's put it this way. I think when you talk about coastal areas, a lot of times, especially with like big hurricanes and things like that, they're going to be, there's a, there's a chance, depending on what damaged the house, that it might not be covered, right? So if they, if they had three claims in a row where it was storm surge and they got denied all three times, they're probably not going to be very happy to see you again, especially if it's like you're standing there going, well, let's see if we can figure out what caused this. Was it the storm surge or the get out of my house, buddy. Um, <laughs> hail is covered by, with ex very, very few exceptions, just about everything, uh, ice ball hits and damages you can probably pay for. Um, so it's, that's one of the things you want to talk about hail. Um, I loved doing hail more than anything because it was, a lot of times people would like file the claim. They don't know that they have hail damage. Well, we got, I see some spots on the deck stain. I don't know about the roof though. Some roofer came by and we don't, we don't want to use them or anything. We just want you to take a look at it and, see, and tell us if there's anything wrong with it. I mean, that's, right. that's a super easy claim. And you go up there and oh, no hail damage or, oh my gosh, look at all this hail damage. You guys absolutely need a new roof. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it a lot easier and it's a little bit less hail. I think hail deployments are, are a lot less stressful in general, unless it's like something that ends up on the news. 
the yeah. national news, like, you know, yeah. some big suburb of some big city gets hit with like four inch hail. And you have know, you done one of those catastrophic hail where they're softball size? I, so I have not done like the, the big, big, I ha, let's put it this way. I haven't done hail claims where I was paying for TVs and couches and interior damage. Right. Like some people like, you know, I missed the, there was a big one in Dallas. I think it was 2016, um, okay. huge. And they were like, I mean, they went all the way through the shingles, the plywood, yeah. uh, through the, the drywall insulation and everything and into people's living rooms. Terrifying. Yeah. I, mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, I, I haven't had to do, do one of those, those kind of storms ever. No, I was, I, it was always like, you know nothing to like maybe three and a half inch hail which you know it, you can see it puts a dent you can you can find splintered plywood on a roof but it's not going all the way through but want to work from home i thought that might get your attention i'll cut to the chase here and tell you that the ia firm paysetter claim service frequently has work from home opportunities for the field and also for desk work which let's be honest really just means work at home in your PJs. Still want to work in the field though? Paysetter's Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover. It is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there right now. Technology is moving faster than ever and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. We put together a free guide to maximizing your productivity while working at home in your pajamas, along with a link to apply to this dynamic firm. And you can find both at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. So, you know, as far as like which storm deployments to accept, I would say as a as a as a new person, I would mm -hmm. would never say no. Right? I wouldn't. I I would just say yes to everything. If they because at this point in your career, and the reason why I say that is is because you know relationship building with the firms and carriers, and you as you know, been having done it for a year, you're going to meet carrier people and you're going to interact with them. Right. So, and they're going to, they're the ones that have that first call list, right. They're the ones that say, you know, Hey, you know, pilot, we need, uh, 25 adjusters to go to St. Louis. And we really appreciate it if 10 of them were these people on this list, right. Pilot's going to be aware of that list carrier. I mean, they're going to send the people that the carrier wants to send that have experience with their process and, and are, get it they take care of their customers and all that kind of stuff um so at this point i would say you're trying to relationship build you're trying to you're trying to find um the firms that you click with yeah. and were you, you did you you didn't go to NACA, did you no no okay i wanted to but coronavirus and i was deployed kind of the whole time so oh yeah, yeah that's too bad um there is a, a big um, Crawford's big cat conference is yeah. in Orlando at the first week of March. It's like February 28th through the 4th. And they've got a whole bunch of classes and you can interview with, you, you can interview with them. And Crawford's a good company. Um, they've been around a long perfect. time. And, and also one, one thing that Crawford um, has that most of their firms don't is that property claims is a small part of their company. They're yeah. a, a multinational, they do all kinds of stuff. So they're a company that you could probably really grow into. Um, wow. so it'd be worth checking them out. Um, okay. Right now, again, like I said, your, your relationship building, you're trying to, you're tr finding the, the firm that do, you click with, um, and you're building your chops, right? So it's really, it's more about get, building that muscle memory, right? Taking as many deployments as you can, with whoever calls, um, unless it's somebody you absolutely just do not click with, right? You don't want to waste your time. Um, yeah. But you're 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 still trying to build at this point, build up your speed. You know, make sure that you're you know tightening up your file quality, um, getting your spiel down. You know that you when you talk to homeowners. Um, mm -hmm. So, I would say right now, take like whatever you can get. Um, yeah. And and uh, relationship build really is kind of the, the big thing, and, and just keep building that muscle memory. Um, later, you know, you can absolutely, um, niche down, you know, learn condos, learn commercial, become the commercial person. Um, I remember I was on a storm years and years ago and I had to take a file or pick up a file, something from somebody in a hotel room who I had never met before. I've been working for this 
for these, the firm and the carrier for like six years and always, you always got to go to the orientations and everything. And I go to meet this guy in his hotel room to pick up this, I can't pick up the file, we'll just say, and never seen him before in my life. Had never heard his name before, but he'd been working for those companies longer than I had. And all he did, the only thing he did was commercial. Mm. And that's like, I mean, if, if you're the commercial guy and they give all the claims, to, as many claims as you can handle, those pay a lot better. They are a lot easier in, a, in, yeah. in that you, I mean, I shouldn't say that they're, they're easier necessarily. They're from a, a customer service standpoint, they're easier because you're, if you get, you know, 15 apartment buildings all in one complex, you're only dealing with one person instead of 15 right. people in every single unit. Um, and that's, it's, you're not multiplying the phone calls and the interactions by 15, put it that way. Dealing with one contractor probably on that. Um, and you can do a lot of those in a couple of two or three days. Like, you know, you get a, 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 an apartment complex and, you know, there's 25 buildings, right? You can, you can do that in three days pretty easily. Um, and that's each, each one of those buildings you get the bill on. So anyway, you know, I would be, I would be, you know, set year two, year three, I would be trying to find out who has a lot of commercial opportunities um, and being pretty aggressive about trying to get my hands on those. A lot of that comes down to a little bit of reciprocity, right? You know, well, Nathan's been out, he's been running claims out in, you know, West Virginia and, and 200 miles one way for one claim kind of thing, doing it with a smile, taking care of those for us. You know, he's expressed that he really would like to do some commercial work. Let's throw some, let's, let's pay him back for, for taking, you know, jumping on some grenades for us because nobody else wants to take those other claims. Right. So, you know, there's, there's ways to get into it. Um, and yeah, so that was, that's what I would say as far as like, you know, picking storm deployments, it, it, it almost comes down to for even no matter how many years of experience you have, it almost comes down to, you know, if that's the only deployment there is, right. This, the person that calls you no nothing, it's crickets everywhere else. And this particular carrier pr pretty much has every single policy in this town. That's going to be the only job. Right. So I would take it. You know, unless, you know, again, and you want to narrow it down to the, the firms that you really like to work for and the carriers that you really like to work for. And it may be that, you know, some big carriers um, will use a bunch of different firms and you really can't stand working for this carrier through this firm, but you've run claims for them with this firm and you love it because they have much more support. The, guy, the people are a lot more laid back and they smile and they, they say, you know, ask how your day is when they call them on the phone instead of being like, what? Like some people can, you know, just no bedside manner. And there's a reason why those people, some of those people aren't in the fields because they, you know, they're great at everything else except for the, the customer service part. Um, and so yeah. sometimes those people end up being your manager. <laughs> I love all managers. Just don't get me wrong on that. Nothing wrong with managers. <laughs> So, all right, your next question. Any questions about that or any thoughts or anything? Oh, it was excellent. Excellent information. Thank you. Okay. Um, is the adjuster position disappearing in the insurance industry? I won't take a whole lot of time on this one. Um, I will say um, in a word, no, absolutely not, which is three words. Um, I ask this question of IA firms almost every single time I, I get my hands on somebody. I'm doing an interview with them. Um, if I'm at conferences or whatever, I'm like, tell me about what's going on with the, the virtual adjusting thing or AI or machine learning and all that stuff. I mean, is, is our, are our jobs going away? And with like one exception of somebody that I, I think was just like mad, everybody has said, you know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net 
slash adjusterTV. That's cplic.net slash adjusterTV. Everybody has said, nope, the, the traditional adjuster role is not going away. It can't go away um, because unless they make a robot that is just like a person with, that's friendly and it can build rapport with the homeowner, people, homeowners are going to be the ones that dictate this. And if, if, if they need somebody to cry, whose shoulder to cry on doing total loss fire, which you know, you've done and you probably have had a nice big wet spot on your shoulder from having, you know, you hand them a, a, an advance check on their contents or whatever here, you know, do what you got to do, buy some clothes, you know, get some whatever. And they're crying on your shoulder. Nothing. To, you got to have a person there for that. Right. Um, in a lot of cases, even a like a hail claim, um, if I own a house, that's a million worth a million and a half bucks. I don't want some dude showing up in flip flops and board shorts with a drone saying, you know, not able to answer any of my questions. Right. Um, so because it's a people person job, it's always going to have to have people with it. It's okay. there it's to, to sort of put the, you know, addendum on that, um, or the, you know, the last little you know, statement about it. it, it is changing, right? So, you know, it, it's very likely, and this was kind of the consensus of the f people at the firms I, I talked to, you know, it's very likely that the little claims, you know, one section of fence blown over, tree limb on the, you know, on the, the deck rail, those little tiny claims, um, we're not going to get so much anymore because people can FaceTime or they can log in and just take pictures of it and, you know, then get a check sent straight to their, their checking account, right? Without anybody doing anything. Um, we're probably not going to get so many of those claims except on big cats where they just like pile all the claims on everybody. Um, but you know, if you're the last person and on a hailstorm in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, they'll probably, they'll send you all of the, you know, the shingles blown off the water spots in the ceiling. Cause you still got to check the roof, but the, you know, the, trampoline that blows over and takes out one section of fence probably not getting that claim so that's that's what i was told the way things are changing the tools that they have these days exactimate mobile i don't know if you had a chance to mess around with sketch ar on that it's pretty amazing I mean, what you can do with that I, so i think that the, the all this machine learning ai you know virtual stuff is you know as as they get things dialed down um, are, are tools that are going to help us just be faster and more effective at our jobs so that you can close more claims in a day and have a file be more accurate, right? You know, I mean, you can take hover and walk, take eight photos, walk around somebody's house and get a roof, roof diagram from it. Right. And even on the most complex, complex, complex roof that might take you 45 minutes or an hour and a half to just to draw, you know, or it might take 24 hours to get the Eagle view sent back to you on you walk around the house and they're going to try to get that back to you within an hour. And that saves me a lot of time. Right. And that's also saves me a lot of, you know, it's safer. Right. So I'm not like crawling down to some edge and trying to get my tape measure down in there and get this little bump out or whatever. Um, so you know, short answer, no, long answer, probably not going to get as many of the small claims. So yeah, that makes, that makes sense. sense. That makes sense. Um, negotiating rates with IA firms. So your question is how to effectively negotiate rates with IA firms and when is it appropriate to do so? I would say that this is like a, you're going to need to have uh, a lot of grace and a lot of like, a lot of, you know, credits build up in your like plus column. And I, I, and I think it's a, a kind of a long-term relationship um, sort of a play if, if you're going to um, try to negotiate rates. Some companies won't do it at all. They'll just stiff arm you um, unless you, you know, unless you play hardball with them, I guess. Um, but if you're working for somebody, this is, this is where I would, I would try to negotiate rates. If I was, if I knew I was on the first call list with the carrier, right? So the carrier wants me there. I'm the top person on the first call list, um, or the top one of the top three people that they're always asking for. Um, and 
they're always using me, which is going to increase my income, right? Just because I'm getting a lot more claims. Um, but I'm still getting paid the same amount as some new person that comes on that doesn't know anything and is fumbling around with the claims. And I'm doing a lot of, you know, reinspections and fixing their work. I'm probably going to be like, listen, you know, 60% is great. Um, but I know that I have, I bring a lot of value, value to the table for you with you guys. Um, we've been, we've had a relationship for three or four years. Um, I would like to talk to you about, you know, let's maybe make that 70% or 68% or 72% or, you know, whatever, you, however you want to negotiate that. But I, I think that if, if you bring a lot of value to the table and you, you remind the person who's got the power to do it, not just anybody, you remind them, you know, you guys call me to, to do something and I always say yes. I've never said no to you guys for anything. I love working with you. The team is great. Um, I would like to talk about, you know, getting a little bit of a raise because of all the extra value that I bring to the table. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's not unreasonable at all. I wouldn't be doing it, you know, if you're brand new, which you're not. Um, but anybody who's like, you know, wants to go on a hurricane and they, they've just got their exact team at level two and a few licenses and they've never run claims and they want to try to negotiate with a firm, the firm is going to tell them to pack sand I mean, straight up because they don't know them, right? They don't, the person could get on, on the event and fail, you know, people with lots of lots of training and certifications and licenses and everything else, you know, you don't, you, your first true test of whether or not you're going to be any good at this is your first claims or the claims that they, they give you. So, and that's what they're looking for. They don't care how long your resume is. Um, so negotiating, yeah, I don't see any problem with that. Um, and it could be that you negotiate into bigger claims, right? Like I, I'd like more total loss claims. I'd like more commercial claims, farm ranch. I love farm ranch claims. Um, you know, what do you love about farm ranch claims? The thing I like about farm ranch is that I, I usually can set aside a whole day for it. Right. So especially okay. if there's a lot of outbuildings and okay. it's out in the sticks. So there's no traffic usually. And I'm just dealing with one guy and we can shoot the breeze for 20 minutes, you know, in the front yard. And then he can walk me around and show me the buildings or say, all right, well, there they are. You know, I got to go back over here and cut some more hay. And it's just, you can kind of be with yourself and, you know, I don't know if there's like, if you're in the city and it's like everybody, I don't know. It's for me, it's like, it's kind of getting out and it's like taking a mental break a little bit. Sounds nice. And, <laughs> and the, there are, again, they're kind of like a puzzle, right? Cause you know, usually with the farm and ranch policy, only the things that are listed on the, the declarations page or they're, they're like their manifest or whatever it is you can want to call it. Only those buildings are covered and they have all their limits and everything. So you got to go find those buildings around there, take pictures of them, scope them. And a lot of times you can, you can bill for every outbuilding. Right. So, I mean, if there's 25 outbuildings and then they have another farm location where they've got, you know, 25 more outbuildings, a bunch of green bins and elevators and all that stuff, you're there all day long. And if there's a bunch of damage, I mean, those claims can get big real fast. Um, yeah. So th I think okay. that's a couple of different ways to sort of get paid what you're worth, you know, is to, is to either, you know, try to negotiate a higher rate, a higher percentage of the, of the fee bill or um and or you know go for claims that have a lot more responsibility that, are, that would end up being a lot bigger um you know because at the end of the day you know if if you're doing a bunch of total loss claims if that's what if that's all they give me you know i'm not going to care as much about the the percentage um i don't think well maybe you, after a while you would who knows did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training? Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, 
as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. Okay, here's, here's is a good one. I like this one. Because <clears throat> I've, I've had to end some inspections. When is it appropriate to end an inspection early if an insured or contractor is being aggressive. Um, I would say, let's talk about aggressiveness, right? What do we mean by aggressive? Like in your mind, like what are you thinking about when you, when you say the word aggressive in this context? I can bring up a specific example and keep the, you know, everything this specific information rather vague, but I had one inspection where there was a contractor present who was rather young and the insured uh, were talking about handguns and having handguns in the home and keeping one in the chamber. And I was thinking to myself, is this a place that I need to be right now? Am I safe as I'm going around taking my measurements? Um, and I've also had, you know, contractors come up on the roof, climb up my ladder without my permission and, uh, start using some choice language up on the roof, not directed at me, but just in general, they were very upset, aggressive, angry. Where's the line? You know, where do you, how do you professionally put the line out there? Well, um, I think that, I think that for me, like in my career, uh, the second anybody like, if I felt threatened in any way, yeah, um, it's it's not like it's you know, you know. Well, you got to be a man, and stand up for yourself, whatever. This is like this is like a professional meeting, right? So, so you're being paid to be there, um, right. and the homeowner is you're you're there at the the um, the homeowner basically is is asking you to be there because they're saying they're claiming right that they have some damage that's caused by covered peril right and you're there to investigate that for the insurance company if if they're you know some people just are can be a little bit coarse which i don't have a problem with um it's if it's like you said if it's directed at you if there's veiled or not so veiled threats for physical harm um you know the one in the chamber if if they're talking about you know, if you feel like they're talking about you, like if you don't do what they want, you know, I don't, people, let's put it this way before I say this, people have been shot, adjusters have been shot before, mm -hmm. um, but I, it's rare. It's like super duper rare. And if you're looking at, I guess it depends on the kind of claim, but if you're looking at like a wind claim or something or a hail damage claim and you got a roofer that's making a, you know, somebody's saying something like that, I'm going to be like that. I'm going to call them out and say that that doesn't make any sense. You, are you, are you suggesting I might like pointedly just like say, listen, I hear what you, what you guys are talking about. And if you're suggesting that, you know, I need to do what you want or you're going to shoot me and risk going to prison for the rest of your life over a roof. I'm questioning your sanity. I, I would feel compelled to say something stupid yeah. like that. Cause what it should do is, is say, you know, stop right where I'm at. If you feel threatened, and I've had, had, had I've had situations where I've I felt like this could go in a very very bad direction. The homeowner doesn't seem to be stable, right? There's something off. Um, the yeah. contractor is super aggressive, and they are, you know, they're getting all bowed up and puffed up or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's it's no longer the, the appointment meeting, the inspection meeting is no longer being productive. Right. It's not constructive. Yeah. If all they're doing is yelling and screaming, you know, I would, I have in the past just stopped right where I was and said, um, this inspection is over. And I just got my car and drove away. Right. Knowing full well, they know why the inspection's over is because they were, you know, showing their rear ends. Um, and then as soon as you get in the car, call the agent, you know, and say, Hey, listen, this is what happened. And I, you know, th they were, using threatening language, they're da, 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 you know, if they want to, you know, redo this or whatever, then 
some, somebody else can go or I can go with that contractor's not there, whatever it is. And then get off the phone with the agent and call your manager, your IA manager, say the same thing. You might call your manager first and then call the agent. Although the homeowner might call the agent and you want to be sure that the agent doesn't get blindsided. So I'd probably call the agent first. Um, but I would say general in general terms, anytime you feel physically threatened or your safety does something, you know, you can get a, a there's a sixth sense. Sometimes you get the, the hairs on the back of your neck go up. I had one yeah. where I was in a, in a, a guy's basement and he was not all there. Something was men mentally, he was something yeah. was, was off. Um, he wasn't saying anything threatening, um, but just the way he was carrying himself and being super, just getting super duper close to me and, you know, asking me strange questions. I'm like, you know, turn around and walk upstairs and, Maybe we'll go talk about this in the front yard kind of a thing mm -hmm. where the sun's out and there's birds in the trees and a neighbor watching. Um, but yeah, second, you know, and obviously, you know, if somebody threatens to take a swing at you or takes a swing at you, don't right. say anything. Just, you don't have to, you're not, and you're not, um, you know, it's not your responsibility to stay, say anything in those situations. You just stop what you're doing, walk away. Because if you do say something and somebody else witnesses something and you get into a, like a shouting match with a contractor, it could end up in court, right? And you say something dumb. Um, I would probably be on the air on the side of keeping my mouth shut as much as possible. And just in general, um, short of like rapport building, you know, exercises. If I got a contractor that's saying a bunch of stuff and I'm not saying anything, you know, um, I don't know. Those are challenging sometimes, you know, if, if the guy's just using, dropping F-bombs all over the place and it's just, is uh, being super aggressive, I'm just, I'm going to do my job for the homeowner and kind of probably ignore him. Um, and if he climbs up my ladder, um, I have a policy, um, and I don't know that everybody agrees with this, but I didn't care if somebody climbed, used my ladder. Um, <laughs> And I never did this, but I know somebody who did that, that they got up on a roof with somebody and the guy like just went ballistic and was calling him every single possible name in the book. And, you know, just absolutely unreasonable, just over the top. And yeah. this guy, this adjuster will say, climbed down off the roof, took his ladder because it was his ladder, put it on his car and drove off. <laughs> just left the guy up there. Um, so, you know, oh, the contractor, wow. they, they risk, they, they run that risk. Um, but I don't know. It's, but it's, if you get any inkling of threat, just get out of there. I would absolutely 100% again, cause this is supposed to be a professional, you know, inspection appointment. You're there to investigate a claim. Right. And if somebody mm -hmm. comes in and wants to like, you know, try to influence you by threatening you and making you like scaring you into paying for the claim, you know, mm -hmm. You can, I guess it depends on your level of confidence. I mean, you can ask that person to leave, uh, or, you know, if, if, if the homeowner is clearly on their side, like the guy has convinced mm -hmm. the homeowner, he spent an hour and a half, two hours there before you even got there, built, getting the homeowner all up in a froth. Um, and the homeowner's like, yeah, I'm packing it and I'm just going to leave because there's no yeah. way you're going to win. You st if you start trying to like interact or, you know, even like correct them. Well, no, that's not exactly true. You know, you're forget it. You know, gotcha. I would, I would, if, if you feel threatened and if you feel like you're not getting anywhere and that the, the person is all they're doing is just chasing you around and like yelling in your ear the whole time, then I would take off. Feel threatened physically. Um, if you're, if you go in there and there's like a coffin full of like grave dirt and the person has really pasty skin and like fangs. <laughs> you know you know shades are all closed i probably would leave then too so yeah kind of piggybacking on that one because i feel like you would have a really good answer to this when uh when you show up to an inspection after you do your spiel uh you know you've you've explained the coverages explain explained the damage to the insured um do you have any good tips or tricks on how to uh, kind of with finesse put some space between you and the insured so you have the time and the space to do the inspection that you need. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field 
or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. Yeah, so I would say um again i mean you're absolutely right you you need to have like compartmentalized things right because if if you're it's, it's a little bit more challenging to do on a like an interior damage claim right where you're right. inside the person's house um if they're if they're talk, following you around asking you questions it can distract you from what you're trying to accomplish um so what i what i would typically do is say um all right i'm gonna go ahead and take a look around the house um I'm, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to tell them everything I'm going to do and, and everything that they, there's a lot, just a short list of things that they'll like on hail claims in particular, they'll always want you to look at. Right. So, you know, I will say, I'll list all the things I'm going to look at and then say, and when I get done, I'll come back around to knock on the front door and, and I'll go over everything I found and explain what the next steps are. Right. So give me about half an hour, 20 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, whatever it is, you know, give them a rough estimate. And then uh, if you have any questions or anything, I'll just be, you know, I'll be out here. Um, and then that way, you know, they know that they don't have to show me the the grill cover or the downspout on this side or the window screen on that side or whatever, because I said it already. Because I asked them about it already when I was on the, on the phone. I'm like, well, what specific damages are you guys seeing at the house? Oh, well, we noticed that the siding on this side and, you know, the bunch of screens got holes in them and they're all shredded and the deck is messed up. And blah, blah. I'm writing that stuff down on, this, on my loss report. And when I get there, I'm going to read that back off to him and say, all right, I'm going to take a look at the roof, um, check the shingles for damage, um, do, take a look at the overall condition, uh, look at the gutters, look at the downspouts, look at the, all the fascia and the vents on the sides and the vents on the, you know, list everything off I could think of that, you know, that they're going to be like, well, did you look at the this? Because they're going to say that, right? Um, and then when I get done, um, so that, to answer your question, that's how I, I build space with them. Sometimes I'll say, you know, you can tag along if you want to, but I'm just going to be taking pictures and getting measurements and stuff and, and, uh. 99 out of 100 times, people, they want to stay inside where the air conditioning is. <laughs> um, occasionally you get somebody that's like, oh, I want to come up on the roof. And I'm like, well, come on up. You know, it's, especially if there's no damage, um, you could walk around and show them because there's occasionally there's that person that's going to really going to want to like look at it. But I would say for the most part, telling them what I'm going to do, what I'm going to look at, and then saying, I'll be back in 20 or 30 minutes or 40 minutes um, to go over everything and go over the next steps works it worked for me yeah. um, but that's a great question too because you know you can this is one of the reasons why i say don't answer your phone while you're scoping losses because i mean it's just one little phone call can 15 minutes you know when you, it, that's choose into the rest of your schedule and it can totally derail you you know the other thing is that people they'll be worried that you're going to see everything right and this is one of the reasons why some people will really want to follow you around and be right at your hip. Um, I will list off all those things that I'm going to look at and anything else I come across, you know, that, that looks like we need to take a look at it, um, get measurements, photos, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll say at some point, you know, later on when your contractor gets here, if he's not there now, I, I really want him to be there, but if he's not there, I'll say, you know, later on when you get, when you get a contractor out of here to, 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 to you know, start talking, looking at getting this work done if you find something else right if he's looking at you know the measurements of, of mine or if i it looks like i missed something or missed something that was damaged that we need to take care of just call me back right no problem 
we'll, I'll get with him and we'll, we'll take a look at it and get it squared away for you. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, thanks. I, you know, cause they, they're worried, you know, they think well, the first check's the only check they're going to get. Right. You know, I mean, you know, this, um, right. they're worried that if you come out and you don't find it on the first inspection, that if it's, they find it later that they're SOL and it's not the case. It's never, it's never the case and it should never be the case. Um, so that's a good question, man. You have some great questions, Nathan. And, and I, I, I like it that you've got some experience because you know some great questions to ask um, that you wouldn't otherwise know as a brand spanking new, not knowing anything, right? Yeah. Um, next question you've got on here is what credit cards, uh, hotels are best for points or rewards? I would say, um, <laughs> I think that Intercontinental Hotel Group is a great one because they have candlewood suites these are mm -hmm. and these are extended stay places with kitchenettes in them right or kitchens um they have stay bridge um holiday and express is not they don't generally have kitchenettes in them but they'll have a, a little fridge or whatever and if you're traveling across the country and you got to st stop a night or two on the way you're almost always going to find a holiday and express um yeah. and i would I, I think as far as like like hotels that you can always find a hotel, they're probably a really good one. Wyndham is another one. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember what properties that they have. Um, Best Western has uh, Sure Stay and Best Western Plus, and some of those have kitchenettes in them. I don't know that those are, I, and I have like a, a Best Western one that I use all the time now for, for the traveling I do now, because I don't need a kitchenette. Um, and but with Intercontinental, um, IHC, um, and Best Western so far, like I've pegged the the points limits on, on both. Like when I had Intercontinental, like the Holiday Inn Express and Staybridge or whatever, I stayed at Staybridge because they're nice hotels, right? They're, you know, and if you, you get like a, a monthly rate or like a weekly rate or whatever, and it can be like 50, 60, $70 a night, which, yes. you know, that's less than half of what they charge if you just show up, right, for one night. Mm -hmm. Um, and the points, I mean, you can pay for hotels. Like I, I got the presidential suite at the intercontinental hotel in Beverly Hills for three nights with points. I still have plenty of points left over, um, <laughs> years ago. That's no, man, it, it was pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> that's how many points I had. It's, I mean, cause you're staying at a hotel. If you're not like living in like an RV, right. If, if you're going to do the hotel thing, 1000% get the points things because you might spend eight months of nights, you know, eight months times however many nights to times 31 or 30. That's a lot of nights. And it, I mean, they're looking at travelers who travel once or twice a week, you know, and they stay like one, they have like one or two. Those are like their business travelers, maybe two or three nights a week, maybe, but you're like, you know, months and months and months and months and months on end. So, okay. yeah, I, absolutely. Um, even yeah. if you, even if you're, you are RVing, but you find that like occasionally you want to stop and like get a good hot shower that you can take a two and a half hour long shower and everything, I would still, and plus yeah. like, listen, I mean, if, if you live in, you live in Ohio now still? Uh, no, now I'm down in Dallas. Texas, okay. So, so you're in Dallas, Texas and Seattle gets four feet of snow, right? And they want you to go to Seattle. And you're like, yeah, I want to go to Seattle. It'd be pretty cool. You know, you may not want to take your your RV up there. That's a long, long, long drive. You might, it might be more cost effective, maybe not more cost effective, more convenient anyway, to fly and rent a car or get some little sedan or something that gets 45 miles to the gallon and take that instead, right? Um, right. Plus, RV campgrounds around Seattle or New York City, forget it. You're not going to be able to stay anywhere near New York or even Long Island in an RV. There's RV, like even Los Angeles. Like you would think that a city like Los Angeles, you'd be able to find uh, a good RV campground. Um, I had to stay. I had claims in Pomona, um, which is like east and kind of southish from LA proper, and I had to stay in a campground in Valencia, which is on the north way north. It's like by, by uh, Six Flags or whatever it is. It's up there. Big, what was that place? Anyways, way, it was like hours, right? Um, 
because I couldn't find anything close by. It's challenging sometimes. So it may, it may make more sense to make me easier just to drive a hotel. And get those points if you're going to do the hotel. And get, the, and get those wonderful <laughs> points. Yeah, for sure. Get long measurements with the best, most durable tapes for commercial and industrial use. That means you, Adjuster. Use code ADJUSTERTV at checkout for a discount on anything at ustape.com. As an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad, expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket? Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on that doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers, not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify, but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. Um, all right. So second to last question, what certifications beyond state licenses are most beneficial for acquiring skills slash work? Um, so certifications, you know, for licensing, you're going to take, you're going to get your home state or your DHS or whatever, and you're going to get a little bit of a crash course in like insurance lingo and whatever, right? Especially, especially if you took like pre-licensing. Um, I would say for skills building, um, at this point for you, um, you might go grab your Hague certified inspector, right? Okay. Which is a damage ID, like roof inspection thing, um, which by the way, I finally managed to get a discount for everything at Hague that any adjuster would want. Use code adjuster TV for a discount um, on Hague certified inspector or the books or whatever. Um, so I think that's a good one to have because you get into a directory and you can, people can look you up and everything and, and you, you get like, you get calibrated to like what the carriers consider to be hail damage and wind damage and, and all that kind of stuff and what's mechanical damage and what's, you know, wear and tear and all that kind of stuff. So you really get like a crash course in that. I think that helps you for skills wise, certainly. You know, probably looks decent on a resume. Um, I don't know that at this point in your career, you know, your resume is really anybody cares a whole lot about it, other than just knowing that you've you've handled so many different types of claims. Which the variety of claims that you've handled is is a huge bonus. Um, and then um, you might even, I guess, it depends on on where you want to go in insurance industry what are your thoughts as far as like the next couple of years or maybe the next five to ten years uh i'm not sure to be honest right now i'm just trying to work out to uh, get the the basics under me and as they say it's kind of like drinking uh from a fire hose so i'm still the drinking from a fire hose phase uh i haven't really mapped out exactly where i want to go i have previous drone experience I think I could do commercial loss. I'm kind of curious about the crop insurance and what that entails. Sure. Um, but as of right now, I'm just trying to learn, you know, what it is I'm capable of and how sustainable is it? Like currently I'm in a state that's a little bit chillier and I had to do three nights. I was in a van and it was negative eight degrees. So mm. I had to fight yeah. through that while also doing total loss claims. So, <laughs> right. I'm Which not quite again, sure. There's another drawback to the RV sometimes. Um, yeah. If you want to work winter storm claims, like we, I, we have our RV. We live in it in the summertime, and we live in a cabin in the winter time. So just, I'm not even, I didn't. It's like you know what? I'm not even going to try. <laughs> just <laughs> just going to winterize it, and uh, we'll just rent this little cabin. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that um, you know, for certification wise. Um, you're at the point where you've, you, it's probably be pretty easy for you to get like an Xactimate level three certification, which, you know, I don't know, the, the firms don't may, may or may not care a whole lot about that, but, but that will give you like kind of a mastery level, like understanding of the software, like every little like knob and switch and button and checkbox and whatever else is in there. Um, 
would be good for you to have to build your skills so that it probably really be helpful on total loss because you know i think the, the final test for level three is like you know diagram is five thousand square foot house kind of a thing um and then you know so so learning software um i would probably branch out and learn core logic which is the name that every that core logic wants you to call symbility so technically it's not symbility anymore it's core logic so when if you you know anyway we're referring to symbility when we say core logic um they have on um in their in their platform they've got free totally free um lms like a learning management system for core logic so you from the, the super duper easy beginning stuff to all the way up to the advanced everything that you ever want to know about how to use core logic you can find it um in their system um so and it you know liberty mutual safe code just went over to core logic which is pretty significant because since they're like a top 10 um yeah. carrier i mean they're they're a big deal um and they told me i actually had a call with them this morning they said that they had two or three other care major carriers that were about to come on board they wouldn't tell me who it was so i can't tell you but um they'll be announcing you know who well who the next person to jump off of exactimate so you know so core logic is the next big thing i would say core logic if if you're an adjuster that is proficient um in both exactimate and core logic i think that you'd be it, it would definitely it absolutely expand your deployment opportunities for sure uh, and put you in a little bit higher demand um so software is important um you know i don't know there's so many things you could do dude i mean there's like if you if you got like um specialized if you were like you know this kind of a person if this was this appealed to you you know you could uh get rope and harness training and, and build out like a really good like like you know steep and high access kit with like the right kind of ladders and you know 40 foot ladder you get a pickup truck with the ladder rack on it and and mm -hmm. you can be the guy that like you know maybe that's just all you do you just do ladder assist on I've, I've done ladder assist like that on uh cats before when i wasn't licensed in the state um or couldn't get a license fast enough they're like well can you want to do ladder assist i'm like yeah i'll do ladder assist sure it'll be fun um but there's i don't know taking you know finding out like some some carriers like uh, um will have like a general certification that you if you want to handle any claims with them you have to pass this certification pass a test and take a little class or whatever um but some of them have other things that you can get certified in to run claims for them so like for example um and it's it's been a few years since i've, I've run claims with these guys so i don't know exactly what they do now but as an example american family had the general general certification and then if you wanted to do commercial claims with them you had to get their commercial certification and then their farm and ranch certification and they would teach you estimating guidelines you know how they want you to handle commercial losses what the you know going through those different policies because they're they're a little bit different there's different things in them as you know um so getting anything i mean networking events probably as important as any skills thing um you know going to things like naca next year you better be there, I'll be um, there. <laughs> make sure you put it in your, your calendar right now um in fact i think the early bird pricing is like 300 bucks i think it's something like that um or at least join 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 naca and you can get a discount on the the conference that way as well but i would absolutely attend naca um and don't i'm gonna get in trouble for saying this no i'm not gonna say oh. it forget it oh um, you know what i'll cut this out yeah cut it out don't take any classes at naca at the convention just only interview that'd be my advice because a lot of that stuff it's, it's a ce stuff you can get by the 99 dollars 35 dollar 45 dollar you know ce package at adjuster pro and take care of that some you know rainy weekend or whatever when there's nothing else to do and you're in your pjs um 
the, I think there's some value in those classes if you don't, if you're brand new, but you're experienced. Um, and by the time that one rolls around, you'll have two, two big seasons under your belt. Um, I would go and just interview and just fill the whole day, interview with every single possible firm. There were 60 firms there this at this past uh, convention in January. Okay. Huge. It was, I think it was their one of, if not the biggest uh, wow. convention. In Orlando every year? No, it was in Vegas. Vegas. It's normally, yeah, it's normally in Vegas. Um, it was in Orlando last year because of COVID and they couldn't. Yeah. Vegas was shut down. Um, you know what? I won't cut that out because, you know, if you, it's it's a um, if you're new, you need to be taking those classes. But you need to, you also need to be interviewing as well. Um, but you're as an experienced adjuster, you're going to know most of that stuff. A lot of it's like intro to NFIP or you know wow. stuff that you may or may not be interested in because you're already kind of locked into this thing. You know that you can't really do NFIP for a few years anyway. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, the, the biggest, the most value you're going to get is, is going interviewing and going to the evening events, right. Finding, you know, when you talk to some of the, the people at the firms, you know, a lot of people go out they go down to the bar at the end of the, the night and have dinner. And then there's new adjusters sitting around like networking with them, um, or adjusters in general, I shouldn't say new adjusters. Um, I mean, we went out a, few, a couple of times and there's just random tag along people and you're like getting to know them and, you know, hey, I've never done claims before. I'm really excited. You know, we're in Vegas. Woo. You know, so, <laughs> uh, but don't stay out all night because, you know, you don't want to come in all bleary eyed and with a headache and cotton mouth yeah. <laughs> with two hours of sleep. Um, <laughs> but so I had this claim one time speaking of letting the dogs out. Mm -hmm. Um, I may have told this story before in here, but I'm gonna tell it again. It, it was, it was pretty funny. I have a number of dog stories. Um, I, uh, early in my career, I would just like open the back gate and just like walk in. Um, and I learned kind of early on that you gotta, you need to rattle the gate, rattle it again, flip the little, you know, the gate latch thing a couple of times give it a couple seconds and then push the gate open and go in. Um, all cause I had a claim, um, in the Des Moines Boy, this was like 2001. Anyway, the insured was not home. Right. And it was in like a kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a smaller house, but they had a huge backyard and the grass was really tall. And I just like, I rattled the gate for a second and then it opened it up and went inside and closed the gate behind me because I was like, well, I don't want the dog to get out. <clears throat> Mistake. Um, because three of these, like one was like a, like a, I don't know. They were like a Australian shepherd or something. And then like a chow and like a, some kind of a pit bull mix or whatever come out from under the deck after I'm like halfway around, you know, taking pictures of the back of the house. I'm in the middle of the backyard and they come out at me and like you're trying to like one thing you this is a, a tip for dogs right they're generally not going to run straight up to you and like jump on you like a german like a police dog will right and like try to bite you that way they'll try to get around behind you and jump up and grab you by the rear end or by the back of the leg or whatever so they're always trying to circle around you and you, one it's hard enough because you're like trying to face them the whole time and they'll run little teeny tiny dogs yeah, rah, 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 rah. and the homeowner's like oh fluffy she's just being sweet and dogs like ah, ah, ah. <laughs> you're like, ma'am, do you mind, you know, just because you, because you know, I, cause I've been bit by dogs before that do that, right? They run around behind you and then they get a hold of your calf if they're small or the back of your thigh, if they're not small. Um, and it hurts, right? Somebody bites you with full strength, even if they just get the skin. I mean, it stings. So these dogs were like tr all trying to get around behind me. And so I'm like three of them. Right. And I ended up getting back over the fence, but always, always, always ask the homeowner, right? The number first step one, Hey, you got any, uh, like adjuster eating dogs in the backyard? I'm not scared of dogs or anything. I just want to make sure that, you know, I don't let any, any, let the dog out or whatever accidentally. Oh no, he'll be inside. It'll be fine. Or no, we don't have dogs. We only have cats, whatever. Right. I don't care what they say. I'm rattling that. Um, I'm doing the thing with the, with the gate every single time. Cause I've had it. It's happened. Well, you know, Fluffy will be inside and Fluffy's outside. 
Right. Oh, we forgot to put Fluffy in. Well, you know, <laughs> you knew I was coming at nine o'clock, right? It's, even when they're home. Uh, anyways, that's who let the dogs out. I let the dogs out. And the story <laughs> that actually, the actual story that I have where I, where the dog got out was I did that in Overland Park, Kansas in 2003, all wood shake roofs. This was a, probably one of my best storms ever. Every single house had wood shake on it and they were just demolished. They were trash, a huge hail. And it was, there was a, the law in Overland Park that you had to have wood shake or wood shingles. Anyway, homeowners at home, do the thing with the rattle. It's, you know, 2003, I've had some dog experiences rattling the gate, you know, and flipping the thing up and down a couple of times, you know, it's the chain link little gate thing and waited a few seconds, nothing. Opened up the gate and left it open and walked straight back up 30 yards into the back corner of the yard and turned around and took the, the back corner photo of the house. And I lowered my camera and right next to the deck, and I looked, I didn't see any, there was no dog there previously. Right next to the deck was a beagle. You know, it's like, with I don't, something about beagles, their, their, their eyes are almost kind of human-ish. I don't know if you noticed this, but this is, anyway. <laughs> um, so I lowered my camera and looked at the beagle. The beagle's looking at me. And then I looked at the fence. I looked at the back of the beagle. And the beagle looked at the fence and looked back at me. And at the same moment, we both ran for the fence. <laughs> and he beat me. And I spent the next 20 minutes chasing down <sighs> Mr. Mr. Beagle. And then the neighbor came home. And they, I think they saw the dog. Anyway, they, they got the dog back in the backyard. And uh, mm. so close the gate and make sure you can, you think you, it's, it's like driving, right? They defensive driving. They say, you know, make sure you got visualize an escape route whenever you're driving down the road, <laughs> look around the fence. You, Cause you never know. I mean, some, the neighbor's dog might've jumped the fence or have, there's a hole and it's, you, you got, you know, 125 pound Rottweiler coming at you. I know I can go over that fence over there. Um, so anyway, that's my dog stories. So <laughs> anything else you could think of that you, uh, you know, well, we got a few minutes here. Only thing I can think of right now is the uh, total losses and the, the clock running down. So I should probably get back to it. <laughs> oh, I got you. Right on. Well, listen, Nathan, I really appreciate you jumping on here. And hopefully this was at least entertaining. Oh, it was actually pretty informative. I learned some things that uh, hopefully I'll be able to get to the level of points where I can do a presidential suite in Beverly Hills for three days. Yeah. Uh, all on points. <laughs> yeah, man. No, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for all the uh, information and uh, thanks for Adjuster TV. It's excellent. Yeah, no problem, man. I, I uh, like I said, thanks for, thanks for coming on and, and uh, we'll catch up with you. I had the fade to black button on my switcher. I was going to say, you just played it to black. <laughs> and we will buy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, thanks for, thanks for coming on. We'll, uh, we'll, I'll let you know when this is going to air, but uh, really appreciate you. And uh, we'll catch up with you later. This is Adjuster TV.